All right, back to the nice slides. So some commonly missed waste streams under B1 um, are your lab wastes, including your quality lab waste and your knock engine waste. So anytime all of those operators take those lovely samples and out in your lab, all of the extra sample in the jar is B1 waste. So that's, that's kind of a common one that we see that um, people tend to miss. Um, marketing terminal waste, so you, if you have a loading rack at associated with your facility, lots of times those are considered co-located under B1 and they are applicable. Um, so you have to consider your meter proving, your filter change outs, your truck heel drains during switch loading and sample waste. So again, you have to kind of uh, make sure you're communicating with all people involved. Uh, maintenance waste, including pump maintenance, turnaround maintenance. We talked about turnarounds, right? Filter change outs, sight glasses, levels, transmitters, pump screen cleanings, and tank cleanouts, et cetera, et cetera. What's the caveat with tank, tank cleanouts? Can you control a tank cleanout? Anybody know? So, what do you do in a tank cleanout, right? You cut a door sheet or open the manway on the side of the tank, right? So, you would kind of think that that, could, that is a it's open atmosphere. Is, is it controlled? Can you consider it controlled? You can. Yes, why? Because there's that stipulation in B1 that when you are including cleanings, when you're opening the side of a tank, it's considered an inspection and maintenance. So you can actually get away with that as long as you're controlling then whatever you're using to move the material from the tank, you can actually control a tank clean out, which is really good because that's a really high benzene stream, right? It's your tank bottoms. Um, yes? Yes. It's, that's a really good question. Can you control a spill? What do we think? Anybody? No. So if you ask Ken Gehring, he's going to tell you no. A spill is never controlled. The answer <laughs> is kind of gray. So I've seen it done both ways, and you can consider a spill controlled if you pick it up in a controlled manner because it technically, and this is again why it's very gray, but you can, you can make the argument that it's not a waste until you, you begin picking it up off the ground. Yes. So. If you choose to do this and control a spill, most of the time you don't, for the little, you know, onesie twosie spills, the one offs, I keep hitting this mic and that's annoying, I'm sorry. Um, for the little onesie twosie spills, it, it, it's probably okay to just to count it and move on, you know, count it as uncontrolled and move on. I've only ever seen that, that argument made for very large spills that really are going to hurt your 6BQ kind of numbers. So, yeah. And then the key for that is document, document, document. And I would make sure that you're being transparent as well in your annual report to make sure that you're basically saying, hey, we had this event, it was large, here's what we did. And I also don't agree with if you count it 100% controlled because that's kind of impossible, right? You're always gonna have you know, oil in the ground and the dirt that you, you gotta pick up. So you need to be kind of conservative there and use that argument very sparingly. So, so waste, correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. So like for instance in a pump maintenance when they when they change out the seal, that lube oil or anything that the seal fluid, that's a waste. It's the fluid itself. So they put that into a mm hmm Yep. Yes, yes. Mo the, the, for pump maintenance, most of the time what I see people do is, is you have like a PM round, right? So there's some sort of like monthly or whatever it is, quarterly, annual, whatever you're, you're switching out your pumps, you'll just make an assumption like five to 10 gallons and kind of move on versus going out there and counting every time a pump is worked on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I make an assumption again and say, hey, they are taking two one liter jars, you know, every round and kind of going, going from there. Yep. Um, any more questions? Good questions. 
Uh, flare header low point drains. This one gets missed a lot, especially if your flare headers are a control device. You really got to be careful there. Um, flares do not always have to be controlled or control devices under B1, and you can choose to kind of make them or not make them depending on how you're using them. But your low, your low point drains can accumulate a lot of liquid if you're not careful, and that is actually, most of the time it just gets drained to the sewer, but um, that is B1 waste, okay? Oh, see commonly missed waste streams in the resources sections of your binder. So again, we tried to make this a little easy and very transparent. There's a sheet in the back with a lot more kind of streams on here that we, we kind of see. If you're building a tab from scratch, it's a good place to start. And then just start building your assumptions and your estimations from there. Okay. Um, some more, marine terminal waste. If you have dock loading. Um, loading and unloading arms, the hose that, hoses that you're using connect, to connect to the barges, all of those, pressure testing wastes, all of that stuff is, is included in your tab. Compressor waste, including steel and lube oil drains, and um, compressor knockout pots. Sometimes compressors have you know, very small knockout pots, and those are commonly missed. Snubbers and distance piece drains, all as part of the comp compressor waste. Um, gasoline blending waste, including waste photo cells, Oh, I'm sorry, protocells and instrumentation page purges and sample waste. Sour water tank oil skims. So if you've got a layer of oil on the, on the top of your sour water tank, you need to be accounting for that in your B1 tab. And then liquid thermal relief valves. So if you've got actually a thermal relief out there with some liquid in it, you, you need to keep, keep track of that as well. See why B1 is not one that you can do from your desk? You have to get out there, you have to involve other people, and you need to talk. So. All right, going back to POGs. Where are the POGs in this diagram? <laughs> it's very annoying. Anyone? Oh, 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 crap. <laughs> right there? <laughs> Where else? Level gauge, this is a pump pad. So basically, a sample point up here, anything that's going to this uncontrolled oily water sewer, that's probably a good bet to where you start counting your POGs. But see this, how this looks is why we were saying that, oh, I can push this button now. Why we were saying that PNIDs become really important or PFDs, see how much easier it is to identify this versus a, on a drawing than anything else? So that's why it becomes a really useful tool to have PNIDs marked up for B1. Okay, consent decrees. Everybody have a consent decree? Most refiners do nowadays, right? So what we're seeing is the consent decrees, it's a result of the settlement between EPA and a specific company and may include one or more facilities. You can, you can have a global consent decree, right, for all your facilities. A CD is usually the result of perceived or actual compliance issues fi found during EPA audits, used in lieu of enforcement action, and the company has to improve operations and prevent future violations of environmental laws at their facility. Pretty standard, right? Everybody kind of knows the purpose behind a consent decree. Um, they're also called global settlements, so I kind of mentioned that. So what we're seeing now is earlier in the 2000s, a refinery enforcement initiative began to address marquee regulatory programs, including B1. So lucky us, we got to have even more confusing B1 rules. Um, a total of greater than 30 refiners now under settlement, covering about 90% of the U.S. refining capacity, and the remaining small refiners are being pursued on a local effort by states and EPA regions. Um, each refinery consent decree can be found here if you really are interested in reading everybody else's consent decrees, but your own. <laughs> so what is normally inv involved with an enhanced B1 program? Tab review and verification. So this is where we've kind of been, we've kind of been harping on you guys a little bit about keeping everything evergreen in your tab. Your audit, you have to audit your waste stream inventory and compliance. That's kind of a given with your annual report, so they have to actually certify that you've, you've verified your assumptions. Um, you have to do a controls evaluation, and then most of the time, um, tab updates required if previous tab determined, determined 
is determined to be incorrect. So this was, think of this as like the early stages of a consent decree. So you just signed it, what are you gonna do? You're gonna do all of this stuff at the top right there, right? Um, then you have to do a corrective action plan, probably develops SOPs, and then upgrade emissions control. This is probably the biggest thing that you guys get out of the consent decrees is those dual carbon canisters. It's not a B1 rule. It is only a consent decree requirement. And then this is the other one that everybody loves to keep evergreen, your slop oil schematics that you've got out there. It's kind of a pain in the butt, right? You're constantly updating depending on what you guys have got out there, what you're inspecting. So, and it has to go in every time you update it. So, just another extra little fun thing. Okay, some more. End of line sampling plans and sampling. So not only do we have the sampling requirement for treatment options or just your normal concentration data, you now are required to sample against your end of line plan. Um, you also, as part of that, have to do a laboratory audit to basically make sure that whoever is analyzing those samples are doing it correctly per the EPA method. So that's another fun thing. Uh, B1 sampling training for employees and contractors performing B1 sampling. Of course, it's very important to make sure that you're taking an accurate sample. You don't want it to be a bad sample and then have it come back too high or even too low. Um, training, oh, yes, training for employees and contractors operating B1 control equipment. So this is one of those things where if your operators are changing out your carbon canisters, you have to document that you're training them on how to do that. So most of the time it's, it's part of um, an ops procedure and it's not really coming from the environmental department but it is something that um, is, is overlooked. Um, stipulated pen penalties for future non-compliance, pretty, con pretty consistent with consent decrees. And then you have increased monitoring, inspection, and reporting requirements. So this gets into quarterly reports. They might make you do quarterly, an quarterly method 21 instead of annual. They can do all kinds of fun stuff in consent decrees, right? So questions on consent decrees? Pretty standard. Okay. End of line plans. Everybody got one of those? Okay. <laughs> Everybody hate those? I did. <laughs> uh, the purpose of the EOL plan is to quantify the uncontrolled benzene quantity through identification of EOL sampling points, sampling, and then flow measurement. It is unique to each refinery based on wastewater collection and your treatment system. A schematic must be prepared that depicts the waste. Most of the time, this is combined oh, with this. Right? Most of the time you do one drawing for both. Um, and then a plan must be submitted to and approved by EPA. Who has an approved EOL plan? Did you get a letter back from the EPA? Oh, the winner. It's very rare for the EPA to actually approve the end of line plans. I don't know what it is, or maybe they ran out of time, maybe they like the stack of paper in the corner of their desk. I don't know, but it's very rare for actually to actually have an approved EOL plan. But that does not mean you do not have to follow your end of line plan. You follow it as if it is actually approved. Okay? All right, sampling. Routine uncontrolled POG sampling. So this can include monthly or quarterly sample of certain POGs. Typically, all uncontrolled POGs that contribute an annual, annual quantity are the ones that you want to focus on. And, and the, most of the time, it's anything above this threshold, which is pretty straightforward. You don't, you're not going to sample something that has a 0 0.05 meg threshold. You're going to go after your big streams to make sure that you're quantifying them correctly. So, all right. All right, so monthly sampling of each EOL location used along with flow estimates to generate quarterly uncontrolled benzene quantities. So this is the main key point on how you are determining your end of line. Um, it includes classic EOL locations, plus uncontrolled non-routine waste generated such as maintenance spills and waste shipped off site. So you're doing this on a monthly basis. Does everybody keep track of this on a monthly basis? It's really hard to do that again. 
So what you want to do, at least what I would suggest that you do, is kind of just make an estimate. So once you've done it for a few months, you can kind of start, start estimating what your waste shift off site's going to be and then the benzene quantity associated with that. Um, it's a lot easier than trying to track manifests on a monthly basis because you're always behind on your manifests, right? That always is one of those that kind of lags behind. So if quarterly EOL indicates greater than quarterly or annual benzene quantity limits, an explanation and or corrective action plan must be prepared. Anybody ever gone over their EOL number, their quarterly? That's good. So these plans, most of the time they're written into the consent decree and what they have to include. Um, they're very detailed. So if you go over your quarterly um, EOL limit, um, the corrective action plan also, it it's normally upticks the sampling to where you're doing a monthly sample, you're now doing it weekly or even daily. So it just kind of depends on your consent decree. So very important that you're estimating your end of line correctly. So, so you said it's okay to do assumptions? Yes. As long as, again, you're documenting, and it's, it's based on, it has to be based on your facility. So you don't want to just say, like, hey, Joe Schmo down the street, hey, they, they estimate one meg for this stream. It, he needs to be specific to your process. But especially for the waste, oh, no, I don't know where that slide is. Um, especially for the waste, which is a really hard stream to kind of estimate, um, I, that's why I feel like, because waste shipments tend to be very cyclical, especially if like you can predict your tank cleanings and when you're going to have big movements of waste off-site, you know to uptick that. So just make sure that it's, it's reasonable and that you can document what you're doing. So what is an EOL point? Typically located at or near the front end of the wastewater treatment plant. So the inlet of the API separator or the skim off of the separator itself. Um, it may also be at manholes, sumps, or lift stations located downstream or within process units. So you want to focus on uncontrolled IDS with greater than 10% water that is directly recycled, so say to a crude tank. And then you have an uncontrolled IDS that pumps into a controlled system. We're going to go through a diagram of this so it makes more sense. But basically EOL is not an exact science. So the EPA says, hey, we want an estimate of your quarterly benzene, uncontrolled benzene, but we're not going to tell you how to do it. So it's kind of an effort and a mass balance that you have to do on where you actually want to, want to pull samples from. Where are the safe locations to pull samples from? Do you have to pop manholes on a monthly basis? Are your operators going to get mad at you for making them pop manholes on a monthly basis? All of those things should be taken into account when you're actually writing your plan. And then wastewater surge tanks can also serve as a centralized location for EOL accounting. So what you can actually do is say you've got multiple streams going into a surge tank, you can back calculate numbers if it's unsafe to take a sample upstream of that. Make sense? Clear as mud? I know everybody loves EOL. I know I do. Okay, here we go. So this is your simplified flow diagram. So what we're going to do here is where are the potential EOL sampling points, which I see they are actually already on the, the diagram. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Interesting. So you can see like what we're trying to do, right? So you have the main oil, oily water sewer coming in. This is your, oil, your API separator. You have a slop oil tank and then you have it's going to your EBU. Here's your, un okay, so I should explain the colors, I guess. B1 units are these. Purple is your EBU. These are just text boxes. Red means uncontrolled. So any of the red lines or the red tank, uncontrolled, okay? And again, what's the point of an end of line? Why are, you, why are we doing this? Why do they want to know you, what your end of line is? It's a quick and easy way to check throughout the year outside of your annual tab report that you're, you're capturing your end of line or your uncontrolled benzene properly. Okay? It's a checks and balance tool that they've forced you to participate in. <laughs> okay? Does it make sense why these numbers are where they are? 
Okay, let's look at it a different way. All right, a, ma a material balance. So again, trying to get a full picture of what your tab would look like on a quarterly basis. So you've got A, B, C, and D. Does that make sense? It's just a summation, right? So you're trying to get the uncontrolled. So you've got your end of line estimate is A plus B plus C minus D, and you get this balance. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's change it up. So what happens if you can't sample here? See, those are probably all very nice locations. You probably got taps off of each one of these lines, drama and valves. Really easy to hook up a sample cooler and, and, and uh, take those. What happens if you can't do it? So you can do it the other ways. Remember how I said it's not an exact science? What if you went upstream into your process units and popped manholes? Can you do that? Yeah. Do you want to? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Look how many sampling points you have. And then you're actually having to like can it out of the sewer. That's not very fun. But you can do it. And then your EOL looks like that. Much more complicated, but still going to give you the right result. Okay? Questions on EOL? Are we comatose from lunch? It's all starting to, we'll play Jeopardy in a little bit and then it'll, it'll liven you back up. So. so some common areas of confusion that we see. So above ground unburied sewer line inspections. Do you have to do those? Yep, you do. What constitutes an above ground unburied sewer line? It's not just your piping off the side of your vessels, right? It's actually part of your sewer system. So you've got something that comes up out of the ground, you have to inspect it. Okay, old data used for waste stream characterization. So this is where we're kind of saying the evergreen stuff comes in play. So say you're making an estimate based on a, a product sample that you took 10 years ago. Do we think that's still valid? Probably not, right? So there, again, that's not an exact science either. Normally we say nothing older than five years. Um, that's something that when I come in to kind of review a tab, I look at. Pretty, it's pretty easy and it's low hanging fruit if an EPA auditor would come in. I would say five years. What's easiest, especially on your process streams, is to get them on some side, sort of cycle, you know, or pull the results from the guys that are actually taking it. You know, some of the, sometimes that's just the easiest. It's already out there, you just got to go ask for it, right? So. Um, deficient tab and uncontrolled benzene quantity documentation. So Brian covered this a lot on every step that you need to have documented. Lots of times some of those pieces are missing. Those are really easy things for an auditor to catch too because they literally can go through the reg and go check, 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 check. If you don't have it, it could lead to fines, right? Organic phase of waste streams not included in benzene waste um, estimates. So in our exercises, that's why we're doing 5%, 1%. You need to be looking at that too because it's kind of unrealistic for a refinery wastewater not to have some oil in it, right? Waste shipped off site accounting including spent caustic. Everybody know that spent caustic is specifically listed out in B1? Are you accounting for that? It can also be an end of line point because most of the time you're selling you're spent caustic, you're shipping it off site. So just make sure that you're kind of capturing that piece. But spent caustic, it's really low in benzene most of the time. And it's really hard to sample. Nobody wants to sample it. So this is a really good case where you can use an estimation on the benzene quantity. Okay. We shipped off site notices to rece receiving facility. So I think we talked about this earlier this morning, but when you are sending your waste off-site to a controlled location, that well, a location you want to consider controlled, the waste shipped off-site notices you have to you have to you have to send one into the to the TSDF, and they have to send you one back. So that most of the time you see one maybe on the manifest or the profile, but you don't see the one in return. So 
The other thing is, is EPA is starting to kind of crack down on the TSDFs because they're finding that they don't really, one, they're all say, claiming they're less than 10 so they don't have to do anything. And then two, they don't really understand the rule. They don't understand how to account for it, mostly because it, it just really hasn't been push, pushed down to them yet. But so that is just making sure that your facilities that you're using for your TSDFs are actually B1 controlled if you are counting your waste as controlled, okay? Sour water stream sulfur or ammonia content demonstration. So again, in the sour water stream exemption, you had those ammonia contents and the sulfur. Anybody remember the numbers? 10 ppm sulfur, yeah, mm -hmm. So, or you have a sour water system that are not enclosed. That's not normally as, as typical in refineries because like you said, sour water stinks and it's got a lot of H2S in it. You gotta protect your workers. But that is out there, right? Frack tank and container management, we talked a lot about that at the break, um, including vacuum truck tracking and those and those operated by contractors. So normally we have a typical vac truck driver company in your plants, right? But what about the one-off projects that are, that are moving stuff around? So you may, gotta make sure that you're actually capturing those trucks and accounting for it appropriately. So you might be able to do it in different ways. To so say it's a tank cleaning and you're using a vac truck, you can probably estimate the tank bottoms that you're moving versus actually tracking the vac truck. So, questions? Okay, <sighs> some more. Missing waste streams in the, tame, the, the tab and the uncontrolled benzene quantity. So see your handout. Again, that's the handout we said with your commonly missed waste streams. Your EB, EBU demonstration. So again, if you're not sampling properly, again, what's the cutoff? 10, 10 ppm inlet for your EBU. Missed floating roof separator seal inspections. So what if you've got a floating roof on your API? How do you have to uh, account for that? What do you treat it as? KB tank, yeah. And then you have to do the annual seal inspections and, in the, and the quarterly visuals and all that good stuff on it. Yep, for sure. Carbon canister breakthrough monitoring. Um, I don't know that I would say that anybody's really confused about that. Are you guys confused about Carbon canister monitoring, you know you gotta do it. You know you have to do it on a daily or 20% of the design, right? Yes? How do you figure out the hardest part I have is figuring out if it's <laughs> Good question. Because that's really Yep. And I bet most of the consent decrees say that it's required, right? You have to measure it at a time of flow, right? I've seen it done a lot of different ways. I've seen it where you actually hold up a piece of paper to the vent and see if it moves. That's your flow indication. Um, some of the carbon systems actually have meters that never turn, right? Because you, most of the time it's on a gravity system off of a tank water draw or something like that, and there's just not enough flow to make the indicator work. Um, I haven't really seen EPA ever crack down on anything like that. Um, and really what I had done at one point, because we ha had that same problem, is I did a study where I actually induced flow at a certain time, measured it, and then stopped, and vice versa. And basically, it, because it's a gravity system, like we were saying, it's so low flow, you do have to have the, con the, the flow indicator, but as what it is, they don't really define it. So it really can be anything. Like I said, I've seen the piece of paper held up to the vent. If it moves, you're good to go. <laughs> no, I don't know how you say that's not fluttering the wind, but I have seen it used and accepted. So, yeah, there's not really a clear answer on that. Uh, missing design documentation on control and treatment equipment. So if you don't have your carbon canister design basis, violation, right? That is required under the rule to have that. If you don't have it, you can actually create it, right? Most of the time it comes from the manufacturers of the carbon canister because they're, the, they're the one that's designing the system for you. They should know how much flow you've got to know how much carbon you need, right? Because you know carbon is an absorption tool. So what you can do is you can take your breakthrough monitoring and back calculate what your, what your, your design frequency is, okay? Some more fun stuff. So what happens when you transition of B1 program to new staff? 
Sloan's going through this right now. And you guys are all said you're newbies to V1, right? This becomes really important when you're learning a program. I was talking to Sloan a little bit about this earlier, is you don't want to be stagnant. You don't want to just do blindly what the last person did, because what if they miss something, right? What if they don't interpret the rule the same way? You know, so you want to make sure that that is something that you're really understanding and make sure you're asking questions when you're taking over a program from someone else, okay? It can be really hard, too, because you lose a lot of tribal knowledge when it, there's turnover. So if, what if the person before you even left? Then you don't have anybody to ask. So. No, you don't have to. Um, I suppose you could. What I've seen it though, what most of the time when you're transitioning to a program, is that the new person, if they find a mistake or they think something is an error, they either cite it as a Title V deviation and move on, okay. correct it, and then you've kind of self-reported already. Yeah, or put it in your quarterly report, both places. It needs, probably needs to be both places anyway if you're finding an issue. But yeah, once you're kind of like self-reporting, I wouldn't go, I, at that point too, especially if it's something minor, I wouldn't even go back and correct tab reports or anything like that. Um, changes in facility ownership. This can really kind of, it sounds kind of silly because B1 is B1, but everybody interprets the rule a little bit differently. What if your new corporate facility or facilitator wants you to do, I don't know, weekly sampling or something? There could be some strong, very culturally driven with facility op op um, ownership. We've kind of seen that just from our discussions, right? Everybody does things a little bit differently, right? Changes in feed stock. So back to your sampling question. That is why we don't like things older than, than five years on your, on your concentration data. Because if you think your benzene's not changing when you're changing your feed stock, think again, and EPA is gonna look for that. They're gonna go through your MOC process and look to see if you've run new crudes that you, you weren't before and stuff like that. You have to do that as part of your tab too. You have to look at your, your, your yield reports basically, right? Okay. Immersion issues. What's new and coming up in the B1 world? So this is a little bit outdated from this first bullet point. I haven't heard of EPA doing that of late. They've maybe given people a break. Um, but they have been conducting, actually, audits of facilities of B1. The other one that they're coming in right after B1 is what? QQQ, because they're so similar, right? So just be careful that you, you don't have some um, overlap there that you're not accounting for properly. Um, but they're doing field reviews of waste management units, integrity issues, they're finding integrity issues with covers on APIs, and then this is really a fun thing that they've been doing. They're using VOC IR cameras on your B1 equipment to see if it's actually leaking or not. Nowhere in the rule does it say you have to do this, but where I've seen it most used is around carbon canister systems to see if you're actually breaking through more frequently. So say, for, for instance, you're using the 20% of design criteria for your breakthrough monitoring, and they go out there and, and, shoot, and shoot it with a VOC camera, and they see vapors. What do you think they're going to tell you? You need to be doing daily. So that's stuff you need to be aware of that they are kind of doing. And it's also a good tool for you to use. Go take it around your API separator cover and see if something's leaking out of a roof hatch. It's really a good tool to kind of help manage your V1. Uh, there's giggling in the back. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so re review of field waste management unit inventory as compared to inspection records. So what EPA is finding when they're doing these inspections is that your records don't match. So the list of controlled equipment that you're supposed to do quarterly visuals is not the same as what your tab. So most of the time you have two different sheets, right? You're not going with this big spreadsheet of your tab. You've got a separate sheet that you're doing quarterly visuals based on. They don't match. So that can be a problem and make sure you're keeping those evergreen as well. Um, oh, they're also finding problems. So do you have a tech doing it? Is somebody, is somebody not trained properly? They don't know what to look for when they're doing those quarterly visuals? If EPA finds it and, and you didn't say there was a problem, 
that could lead, lead to enforcement as well. Um, and then again, here's that old data. So if your assumptions are not being updated properly, um, they really are going to start cracking down on that. Okay. So old data, is that you were saying five years for, for some things? Is there a definition on what? No. Nope. Five years is just kind of our recommendation for you. Um, in some cases, it might be a stream that never changes, and that's possible. Um, I, I think it's a good idea to continually sample it, but... Um, Right. If something's changed dramatically, it's also going to le lead to them kind of raising their eyebrows on, wow, this is old data and you've built a new unit or something, you know, right? But um, for streams that never change, or say it's really hard to sample it, you know, some of the streams you might not be able to get until a turnaround even, then you're already on that five-year cycle and it becomes a little harder to kind of do that sam sampling. So that's where I would recommend doing like the process knowledge. Talk to your engineers and, and say, hey, is this a, do you agree with this assumption kind of thing? Get somebody's buy-in to help you kind of like with those estimates. Okay, so integrated refinery and petrochemical facilities with one tab. So this was what it was in 93. They had a refining and a petrochemical plant and they were reporting one tab. Then, they sold this off. This is, I don't, this actually happened, but I don't remember which company it was or anything like that. But they sold this off, and then they had two. So you can see the 6BQ went from 5.5 as a joint to 5 and 3. That raised some eyebrows on EPI, in EPA's mind because now suddenly your emissions went up, right? So in some cases, they actually came, they would like, they made the argument that they wanted this to be one tab. The company won this, they didn't have to do this. But, um, but it can be kind of a trouble, troublesome area and just keep it in mind if you, have, if you have a facility like that, if that were to ever happen to you, so. Okay, all right. Interconnected facilities, two tabs or one. So the scenario that we just talked about. Several companies operating historically separate but now interconnected nearby facilities under common ownership facing questions regarding combining separate B1 programs into one. So they're required to share the tab, the 2BQ or the 6BQ. Usually no evidence that EPA historically considered sites to be the same facility. So if they had, like we were talking earlier, if they had different EPA numbers that kind of helps strengthen that case. Um, various levels of interconnectedness between the facilities. If you're sharing products and intermediates, you have sharing the tankage. That can all kind of lead to those kind of questions. Wastewater treatment plants is a lot. You have a nearby facility, you might be sharing the sewer system. It's just easier from ease of construction. Probably been there that way for 100 years, but EPA is starting to kind of look at it. Various distances between the, the um, facilities in question. What's considered adjacent, what's considered co-located, you know. Um, is it, do they have to share a fence line or can it be miles down the road? It's all an interpretation question and EPA kind of asks those questions as well. And again, EPA is kind of silent on the, question, on the questions as well. So that becomes kind of your job for your compliance to determine that. So sometimes it's easy. If you share a fence line, I'd pretty much say you were adjacent. But if you didn't, what if you just have a mile down the road kind of thing? I don't know. I, I don't, might be kind of interesting question, right? Okay. I mentioned this one, other emergent issues, TSDFs. So just be careful when you're, when you're shipping waste off site. There aren't too many TSDFs that I know of that are actually controlled for B1. If you're using an incinerator, for instance, that's probably a good bet. But again, you don't get to take credit unless you have that documentation that says they are controlling it when it is on their property as B1 waste, right? I've also heard of TSDFs turning away B1 waste because they know it's coming up and EPA is starting to look at it and they don't want to take B1 waste. So just be careful with that as well. So be, make sure you're talking to your TSDFs. Um, use of EBO, EBUs as vent gas control devices. So what people are actually doing is they're bubbling 
vent gas through the EPA and using it as aeration. And they're calling it a control. It's been proven, so it, it does actually work. You're shaking your head. Do you do it? <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, the site that I know of that actually does it, it took um, like years of sampling and, and data for them to get it approved. So, but it is out there. Um, chemical plant B1 enforcement initiative. So I said EPA was going around to the refineries. They also started going around to the chemical plants. So again, the chemical plants tend to, um, I don't know, just, they're just not as familiar because it's mostly a refinery sewer kind of question with B1. But um, the EPA started kind of going around and trying to crack down on them as well. Okay. NSPS QQQ compliance issues. So if you're compliant with B1, do you have to comply with QQQ? What if you have a, this is getting into my discussion for tomorrow, but what if you have a controlled um, sewer for B1? You've got all the ju junction boxes are sealed up, carbon, you're doing all the inspections that you need to be. Do you have to care about QQQ? Yes. You have to care from a compliance standpoint because if you trigger QQQ, there's notifications that have to go in under NSPS. But you do not have to do anything else to your sewer systems. If you are compliant with the controls for B1, you are covered for QQQ. B1 is more strict. But it can go the other way. If you're compliant with QQQ, you are not necessarily compliant with B1. So that's where the confusion kind of lies. Okay? Spills in B1 control, we talked about this one and how that's a pretty gray area. So just be careful. And if you are trying to call a spill controlled document, 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 please. So, okay, I, I did actually use that once in my career. <laughs> what you're calling controlled is you're picking it up quick, quickly. So most of the time, Circle says you have to do it within, what, 48 to 72 hours anyway for a spill that's large. Um, you're picking it up with a controlled vac truck or in some sort of controlled manner. So you, you've got the documentation, you've done the method 21, you do the visual inspections. That whatever tool you're using to get it off the ground is a controlled B1 piece of equipment. Then the container that it is going into to sit or whatever is also controlled. So controlled vac truck, controlled frac tank, controlled roll-off box. Whatever you're doing, make, make, maybe, it's, maybe it's going into another tank. I don't know, floating roof tank. Does it as a fixed roof to a control device? All of that stuff has to be in place in order for you to even have a chance with calling it, calling it controlled. And then like I said, I would not say that a spill is ever 100% controlled because think of, think of what the intent is behind B1. Most of the time you think of it as benzene sees the light of day. That's where you're counting it, right? A spill is open to the atmosphere, right? This is why Ken Gehring will tell you, no, no, no. But sometimes if you're, if you're kind of controlling it and you're really, really truly, your intention is good, I, I think you can do it. So. And then the quantity is the amount spill, not the emissions, the air emissions. Correct. Like, it's just the total yes. Yes. Yeah, B1, even though it's an air reg, it's really governing what's in the water or the liquid. Okay? And then future rulemaking, we don't really know. We don't know where benzene's going, but B1's going. You kind of saw that really early in the morning, all of that history that Brian went through. So it has had a lot of um, talk. And B1 has been around now for, what, 20 more years? And look how many new people are in the room just learning it. So there's still always um, areas for improvement there. Okay. All right. Are we ready to play Jeopardy? Okay, we're going to split you into teams. You have to come up with a team name. We're going to keep score. Uh, Brian, what time is it? Do you want to take a short break? Brian and I will set up and we'll come back and do our teams and all that good stuff. 
see how much you guys really learned today. <laughs> Two fifteen. We did pretty good. Mm -hmm. I said two fifteen. That's good. Yeah. Hmm? Hmm.